Father, how we love you, Lord. How we worship you, Lord. How we thank you, Lord. Wash over us, O Lord. Pour out your Spirit on us, Father, that we might receive from you, Father, an impartation, Lord, a download from you, Lord, right into our kishkas, right into our spirit, right into our heart. Pour it out from heaven, Father God, pour out that oil that would drip from the top of our heads down our beards onto our garments, Father. New oil and new wine, Father God, that we would be refreshed. Change us, O oh God. Transform us. Wash over us the streams of living water and refresh us this night. In the name of Yeshua, amen and amen. You may be seated. God bless all of you for being here. Shabbat shalom to you. We're delighted to have you in the house of the Lord. Amen. We're getting ready to kick off tonight the fourth installment of the series on spiritual gifts, and we've laid a foundation over these past couple of weeks from the Word of God that clearly states that everyone who is a believer has at least one gift. Everyone who is a believer has at least one gift. Everyone has a gift. Now, some people have more than one gift, and nobody has every gift, but I want to tell each and every one of you that walk with the Lord, that know that Yeshua is Lord, that have been infilled with the Holy Spirit, that you have a gift. And to understand this gift, you have to weigh into it, and as we preach this series on the spiritual gifts, there are certain gifts that are going to touch your heart. They're going to quicken you to say, you know what, I can relate to that, I can identify with that, that's me. And when that's you and you realize that maybe in your life you're not applying that gift, you're not using that gift, you're not using that gift in God's economy, you're not using that gift in your corporate life, you're not using that gift in any aspect of your life, and you're saying, I wonder why I'm not fulfilled. Well, you're not fulfilled because you're not using that gift. And God's imparted that gift, He's invested that gift, He's placed that gift specifically in you because that's the gift you need, not the gift you want. That's the gift He chose for you. And you can't be jealous and envious of other people's gifts. You have to receive and walk and apply and activate the gift that God's given you. And when you do that, you'll find fulfillment. When you do that, you'll find refreshment in the things you do for the Lord. You won't get tired. You'll find out that God gives you more time than you ever had before when you're walking in the gifts and using the gifts He's given you. There's many gifts, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12 and 4, and this is kind of the foundation scripture over the past four weeks and over the coming weeks for this series. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them and all men. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. This is the Word of God. He gives them to each one just as he determines. Not We don't put in an application. I've now said yes to Yeshua, and uh, I want to go over to the spiritual vending machine and let me see. I like chocolate and peanut butter. I want that gift there, and we put our money in, and we get that gift, and it doesn't work that way. God gives them to each one just as he determines. Because he knows what it's going to take for you to be fulfilled. He knows what it's going to take for you to be active in his economy. 
He knows where your greatest level of contribution is going to be, and He guides you, and He leads you, and He makes it so you like certain things, and you're good at certain things. And you wonder why you're particularly gifted. It's because God gave it to you. Now, tonight we're going to take a look at the gift of discernment. The gift of discernment is the special ability that God gives to certain members of the body of Messiah to distinguish between truth and error, and to know with assurance whether certain behavior purported to be of God is in reality divine, human, or satanic. People with this gift can distinguish truth from error, right from wrong, pure motives from impure. They can identify deception in others with accuracy and appropriateness. They can determine whether a testimony attributed to God is authentic. How many of you have turned on your TV and seen things that aren't authentic? You've been in a place and you've heard words that aren't authentic. I can relate to you the story that when Miss Laura and I first came to Birmingham, we hadn't been here, let's see, we started the congregation in February and Passover was in April and we went somewhere two months after we just got here. We just planted the congregation here. And somebody said, I have a word for you. And I said, okay, tell me what that word is. This is your season of relaxation. This is a new season for you. You've labored hard and long in God's vineyard, and now you're entering a season of rest. You ever start a congregation? It is anything but a season of rest. And we haven't labored long. What? We had had two services. And we thanked the person very much, and we walked away and said, no, that's not right. But how many of you heard that? A word's been imparted to you. Oh, so saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Oh, wait, I just got a word from... Now, of course, you can get a word from the Lord, and we fully support that, and we acknowledge that. And if you're reliable and you're credible and you're a member here and you have a word for the Lord, write it down, pass it forward. Let the spirit of the prophet be subject to the prophet. Let everything done be done in decency and order. Let God be glorified, not the person offering up the word. Let God be glorified, that he's present, that he shows his presence by imparting to us something specific, something relevant, and something that lines up with Scripture. People with this gift recognize inconsistencies in a teaching, prophetic message, or interpretation. And people with this gift are able to sense the presence of evil. So they can distinguish between good and evil. They can discern whether or not what they're hearing is truly from the Lord or whether it's a trap. It's a wonderful gift to have, and many have it. Now, people with this gift are most often described as perceptive, sensitive, decisive, truthful, insightful, challenging, intuitive, and discriminating. And you probably know people like that in your life, and the people like that in your life that you're drawn to describe that way more than likely have the gift of discernment. If this gift is, like like all others, is not governed by love, it's worthless. If this gift, like all others, does not direct us to Scripture, it's ungrounded. And if this gift, like all others, is not centered on Messiah, it's false. And there are false gifts, and there's false manifestations, there's falseness throughout the Word of God, and this gift of discernment. And what you want to do is you want to hitch yourself to somebody with the gift of discernment. You want to travel with somebody with the gift of discernment. You want to go to these teachings and these preachings and these camp meetings and these revivals. You want to go right there in the the move in the prophetic with somebody that has the gift of discernment. And you want to look at them and go, is that right? Because if you don't have that gift, you want to weigh yourself into a person. You want to connect yourself with somebody that has that gift. Now, like all the gifts that are defined in the New Covenant, they're certainly present in the Old Covenant. Psalms 119, 125, I am your servant, give me discernment that I may understand your statutes. Proverbs 3, 21 through 26, my son, preserve sound judgment and discernment, do not let them out of your sight. They will be life for you. An ornament to grace your neck. 
Then you will go on your way in safety, and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Have no fear of sudden disaster or of the ruin that overtakes the wicked, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being snared. Don't we all want that, a restful sleep? We want discernment. We want to hunger and ask the Lord for discernment. Because the truth of the matter is, if you're faithful in the gift that God's given you, if you're fulfilled by using the gift that God's given given you, you can go to Him and ask Him for another because you can be trusted. But if you haven't used what He's given you, don't ask for another. Be faithful to have God direct you and put you on the path to being able to use it for His glory. 2 Chronicles 2 and 12, And Hiram added, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel who made heaven and earth. He has given King David a wise son, endowed with intelligence and discernment, who will build a temple for the Lord and a palace for himself. Now Solomon is credited as the wisest of wise, yet Solomon stumbled in the end. He was a wise man that had discernment. God gave him this gift of discernment. And as long as he was using that gift... He stayed out of trouble. But the minute he turned to the flesh, even with the gift of discernment. So the gift of discernment is not a get-out-of-jail-free card. It doesn't keep you out of trouble unless you apply it. And like every gift we have, it can sit in a box on a shelf, and tomorrow many of you will get many gifts, and if you never open the gift, what good is it? What good is that shovel that hangs in my garage that was given to me many years ago if I never take it down and dig a hole? A gift is only of value when you put it to use. First Kings 3 and 9, So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong, for who is able to govern this great people of yours? That's interesting. There's many in the Bible who demonstrate this gift. But God has ordained this night. And when I tell you He's ordained this night to tell you about this couple, when I tell you about this couple, you're going to say, It's by the hand of God. Because the whole time we were away and I prayed about, Lord, what is the sermon going to be on Friday night? What's the sermon going to be on Friday night? Nothing was popping. Nothing was connecting. Nothing was connecting. And it really wasn't until yesterday afternoon when all of a sudden all the lights went on. And God said, I want to show you something. A story that we've become not chased about or calloused about, but a story that we don't really understand from the true deep, deep, deep scriptural nature. Oh, we look at the story one way, and we glorify the story one way, but the truth of the matter is this Jewish couple was involved in something that was totally confusing. It made no sense at the time. And when you apply the social standards to what they were going through, the course of action was pretty clear as to what they should do. And had it happened today, the course of action would have been a tragic one. And this Jewish couple was faced with a situation that no Jewish couple should be faced with. It was inappropriate. It was unfortunate in many regards. It went against all the laws of the land. It would have been troubling to a father and it would have been troubling to a mother. And yet this Jewish couple faced it. And when they faced it, they faced it with such a unique gift of discernment that it changed the course of history forever. Separately, they had the gift of discernment. Separately, they applied this gift of discernment, and because they separately applied it, they both were able to be led by the right thing, and they were able to distinguish whether or not this was an evil deceptive plot to destroy their life, to destroy their families, or was this truly divinely inspired? Were they able to discern that the voice that they heard was from an angel of the Lord? Were they able to discern that regardless of the circumstance and the social pressure and the appearance of the difficulty that they were both facing, could they both respond in a way that would change the course of history? This Jewish couple was faced with this decision What do we do? And what they did, God told me to share with you tonight. Here's their story from Matthew 1 and 18. This is how the birth of Messiah Yeshua came about. 
His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. Miriam pledged to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. And because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Yeshua, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet Isaiah, the virgin will be with child and will, call, and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. He had the gift of discernment. Here he was told something so contrary to what his inclination was, so contrary to what his nature was, so contrary to the social values of the time. And his discernment kicked in, and he believed that it was an angel of the Lord. And that what was imparted to him by this angel of the Lord was so great, was so marvelous, that when he woke up, he did exactly what he was asked to do. That's what the gift of discernment does. It flies in the face of logic. It goes past the circumstances and the conditions and the condition of the people that are involved, and it recognizes beyond a shadow of a doubt. And because discernment quickens you to do what is right, not only can you hear from the Lord, but you can act upon it. And when you have discernment and you step out in faith and you activate that discernment and you go where the Lord leads you to go because you know it's from Him, great things will happen when He leads you. Great things happen to the children of Israel as they follow the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. And they went where God took them because they weighed into what they saw. And when you hear and you have this discernment and you go where God calls you to go without fear, without equivocation, and you act, you're activating your discernment. And Joseph had that discernment. And in verse 25, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Yeshua. Yosef, a Jewish man, who based on the timing of things, it would have become apparent. And because of the orthodox, the pharisaical conditions of proving that when you take your wife into the bedroom chamber, and you consummate the marriage, there is evidence of her virginity. And he knew because you race through all these things when you're told these things that there would be no evidence. And so what he chose to do was he had no union with her until after she gave birth to a son. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 26 through 55, we read, The other story. The other one involved with this tremendous gift of discernment. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, Miriam. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. See, when you have the gift of discernment, it doesn't mean you fall for every line that comes along. You weigh it. And there she was weighing it. What kind of greeting is this? I'm highly favored. What kind of this is the greeting is this? You stranger, somebody she hadn't seen before, approaching me and saying to me and declaring, is this of the Lord? Is this not of the Lord? And you see her testing and weighing it carefully. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Yeshua. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary's thinking that, uh, huh, his father David. 
Well, I met his father. His father's name's Joseph. Who's this David character? Oh, you must have me mistaken for somebody else. So Mary responds, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. And Mary's response, now that she's discerned, now she's discerned, she's talking of the angel of the Lord. He's given her something into evidence that verifies and validates, for she knew Elizabeth was pregnant. Knows a lot about her. And is telling her the future events. And says, Mary's response is simple. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord shall come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And so this gift of discernment is recognized on Mary. And you will recognize the gift of discernment on people who are discriminating. And you recognize in them. That's who I want to go seek counsel from because that person has the gift of discernment. And it was so prominent on her, so prevalent a part of her character that Elizabeth acknowledged it. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for He has been mindful of the humble state of His servant. From now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. His mercy extends to those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with His arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped His servant Israel remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. And God chose Joseph, Yosef, and Miriam, both with the gift of discernment, to usher in the Messiah. Through the course of their life and after the birth of Messiah, they heard from an angel of the Lord that Herod was plotting to kill the baby. And so they left town. They were about to return and the angel said to him, not yet. Then it became time, and the angel of the Lord said, those who are trying to kill you are now all dead. And because they had an open door of discernment, they were able to distinguish whether or not this was the enemy. Because Herod was acting as an agent of the enemy. And if you destroy the Messiah, Satan reigns forever. Both Mary and Joseph heard and obeyed and activated their gift of discernment. If yours is the gift of discernment, God has equipped you for counseling, mentoring, leading others in Bible study. Keep in mind the Holy Spirit has gifted everyone with at least one gift. No one has them all, but everyone has at least one. Do you have the gift of discernment? Are you able to tell good from evil? Are you able to hear a word and in your spirit know whether or not it's of God or if it's of man? Is this gift yours? And do you have the discernment tonight to know that the words I spoke to you are true? That God has a plan for each and every person that begins with one step. 
And that first step being the greatest step, the greatest journeys, all throughout history have always begun with the first step. No no journey begins with the final step. They always begin with the first step. As I shared with you tonight about the gift of discernment, one of the things that I shared with you from the very beginning was that all these gifts, whether or not it's discernment or it's prophecy or it's healing or it's speaking in tongues or interpreting in tongues, interpreting tongues or whether or not it's miraculous signs and wonders, all of this coming from God is a gift of the Holy Spirit. In order to have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you must have God living inside of you through an invitation for Jesus, Yeshua, to come live in your heart. For all these gifts are birthed by the Holy Spirit. In order to have access to the Holy Spirit, you must have received the Messiah. What better night than tonight as the world celebrates? No debate whether or not it is or it is not the birth. This is when people choose to celebrate. So be it. We rejoice that he was born. The day makes no difference to me. And so in this rejoicing in the birth of our Messiah, what a great night for your birth. You know, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that anyone who's a Messiah is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. It's a spiritual birthday. It's a day to celebrate new life. Being born into sin because the blood of man is in us. The Word of God says no one is righteous, not one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and there is no sin in heaven. So in order to enter heaven, in order to be heaven-born, heaven-bound, you have to be heaven-born. In order to come into the kingdom of heaven, to have eternal life, to be eternally with God as opposed to eternally separated from God, whether or not you believe in a lake of fire, whether or not you believe in eternal damnation, whether or not you believe in a hell, whether or not you believe in any of that, doesn't matter to me. Hell to me is separation from God. I don't care where it is. It could be Toledo. It could be Omaha. It could be Birmingham. Separation from God is hell to me. But there's only one way you can ensure that you're not separated from God. doesn't matter what the location is when you're separated. What I want is I want that ticket that says, I'll never be separated from God. I lived 42 years of my life separated from God. That was hell. And if you're here tonight, and you don't have that that hope, and that promise of where you'll spend eternity. And there's even the slightest possibility that you, might set a, that you might spend the rest of your eternal life separated from God, then I want you to listen to me carefully. Because if you're unsure, in any part of your being, if you have a question as to where, you go, where you're going to go when you die, if you have one even shred of doubt, I'm talking to you. While the temple existed and the altar existed, there was a place to bring a sacrifice to make atonement for our sins. But when the temple was destroyed, there was nowhere to bring the sacrifice. There was no way even to cover our sins, let alone have them taken away. And there's no sin in heaven. That means when you get to the door of heaven and they open the door and say, who is it? And you give them your name and they look you up and you're not in the Lamb's book of life because there's sin all over you. They can't even see who you are because all they see is the sin in your life. And you plead with them and say, but I never murdered anybody. I never robbed a bank. I was a good person. They said, good's not good enough. There's only one good. Unless you ride in on his coattails. 
Unless when I hear your name, I hear his name. When I see your face, I see his face. When I see the record of your life, I see the record of his life. Unless you have that, you're not getting in. Oh, but Rabbi, all paths lead to God. No, all paths lead to the door. But you've got to grab a hold of that door, Yeshua, to walk in. Don't let the world confuse you. Don't let the fast talkers and the sweet talkers and the I'm okay and you're okay confuse you. It's not about psychology. I'm not okay and neither are you. There's only one. Now on this night, I'm going to share with you that John 3.16 says that for God so loved the world, He sent His only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in Him would have eternal life and would not perish. His name was Jesus. We call Him Yeshua, the Hebrew word for salvation. In Matthew it says that no greater love than this than for one to lay down their life for another. And one laid down his life for all. One sacrifice made to wash away all your sins. And if you're here tonight and you've never said yes to the promised Messiah, I want to give you that opportunity. You say, how do I do that? You say a simple prayer. You say, Lord, I'm sorry that I've sinned against you. And I ask Yeshua, Jesus, into my heart. And I believe that he died for me and that he rose again on the third day. And now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding for me. And because he lives, I can live now and forever. And if you're here tonight and you've never said that prayer before, just slip up your hand. And I'll say that prayer with you. If you're here this night, and you've never said that before, you've never accepted the promised Jewish Messiah, just slip up your hand, and I'll say that prayer with you. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? Is there anyone? Never said it before. Never said it before. Well, that's okay. It's the same. He's the same. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Let's stand to our feet. Lord, in the name of Yeshua, the name above all names, Father God, I ask that each one of you receive this night a special touch from the Lord. That you receive a personal revelation of what this night is all about. That God would speak directly to you and through you, piercing to the very marrow of your bones, new life in Messiah. That as this year closes out, that the Lord would pour out a refreshing, a renewing, that the ember that's been just burning in you, be fanned into a flame, a consuming fire. A fire so bright and so bold that not only would you be changed, but everybody around you would be changed. We praise you, Abba. We thank you, Father, for the mighty work you're doing here, for the great year that we've had. And I ask you to pour out your spirit on each and every person here in the name of Yeshua. Amen.